Okay. All right. So, welcome, Hoshamadi, uh, as they say in Persian. Welcome. Um, Zala and I would like to express our appreciation to the Jewish Family Services of Western Mass for recognizing the need to give extra attention to the resettlement of these newly arrived Afghans and for organizing this series of presentations. We really appreciate you setting aside your time to learn more about um, the Afghans who are here and hope that it will be usefully impactful for your work with them. Um, our approach in general is to talk about Afghanistan, the country, geography, ethnicities, religions in a general way, as well as family structures, gender dynamics, basic health and hygiene practices, and to bring focus on mental health issues. And um, usually we kind of do a whole cultural introduction and then focus on school or you know something like that but this time we're going to kind of weave some of the mental health issues throughout because i should like to say up front that while of course there are all kinds of mental health related issues uh, addressing them can be quite taboo so we're going to mostly just talk about the places where some of these issues come up um our presentation is about 40 some odd minutes long and we um we will welcome you to put comments or questions into the chat. Um, and of course, we'll have some time at the end to address them. And we will meet again in a week to discuss follow up kinds of questions and things, further things that you want to discuss. So we both apologize for a very general introduction to a very complicated society with many languages and cultures and religious practices and ethnicities and educational differences and social and economic classes. Um, as, but nevertheless, it's hard to give an introduction without generalizing. So of course, and we'll probably keep saying this, not everything we say applies to everyone. Um, I have more experience myself in rural Afghanistan um, and Sala luckily balances that with um, a more urban experience and the two worlds can be quite different at times. So we'll be bringing you information from both sides. Um, nearly every image that we're using is one of our own. We are aware that there are many sensitivities that Afghans have around photographs, particularly of women. And we do have a few photographs by um, a really wonderful Afghan photographer named Fatima Husseini. Her, her work is beautiful and really stands out. So I will hand the floor to Zala, who will introduce herself, and then I'll tell you a bit about who I am. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and hi, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you for your time and interest uh, to learn about um, Afghanistan culture, uh, which will definitely help um, in your work um, or just as a being a, a neighbor of an Afghan family who recently arrived to better understand them or be there or just, you know, like be welcoming or uh, resolve their problems maybe at times. Um, I'm Zala and I'm an Afghan, I'm an immigrant and um, I can call myself also, I'm an American. I got my citizenship in 2018. Um, I was born in Afghanistan, but I grew up in Iran and Pakistan and last 12 years in US. So I lived that refugee or immigrant life in different countries. And I'm very well aware of uh, the challenges um, that uh, you as a child and then as an adult face and also, of course, your family. Um, I have my uh, undergrad in social development studies and uh, my master's in international economics and uh, in finance on a Fulbright scholarship from Brandeis University in Massachusetts. And, um, and uh, my work experience last 12 years or 15 years, I have worked in international development with a focus on uh, girls' education, women economic uh, development mainly. And I'm, um, uh, I co-founded a nonprofit back in 2010, where we focus on these issues um, uh, in Afghanistan. And um, last year also, I started a social enterprise, um, uh, which is again for women economic uh, development. And it's still running. Um, and we uh, reopened it in November, 2021. And we are we are helping women to have jobs through production of reusable pads, uh, reusable pads in Afghanistan for domestic use. 
And um, I also worked in uh, two months uh, uh, at Fort Dix, which is a good experience uh, being with Afghans who recently arrived and really, really like learning uh, firsthand their, their problems and their experience of coming to the US. And most of them, they came from rural parts of Afghanistan. So that was also a good learning experience for me. Um, yeah, so I'm here and um, as Rachel said, we will have the presentation and then we will be happy to answer your questions um, um, on the best of our knowledge and experience. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Zala. Uh, and I have to add that um, Zala and I have worked on multiple research projects on Afghan women's leadership and authority with our colleague at University of Colorado Boulder, where we're both associated as research associates. So we have our hands in a lot of different pies together. Um, my name is Rachel, and I have had a career, amazing career, I think, formulated by Afghanistan and its surroundings for a very long time. I took up Persian, the dialects of which are spoken in Iran, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan when I was in college because it fit in my schedule and because it has a beautiful script. And that was enough for me to make a decision that changed my life. And um, I went on to pursue languages and linguistics for my PhD. I studied in Iran before the revolution. I was traveling in Afghanistan just before the Soviet invasion and was a Fulbright scholar in Soviet Tajikistan as well during, during the Soviet era. So I ended up writing a modern grammar of Pashayi, which is a minority language. And I know there are some Pashayi speakers in the Springfield area. It's a very small endangered minority language, but it's the community that I've spent a great deal of time with in the countryside. And I helped women in that community form an NGO called Rubia that did um, income generation through heritage craft and uh, embroidery in particular. So I've spent time in Afghanistan as a friend, as a researcher, as a family member. I've, um, I've um, made, I trained USAID, State Department, Department of Defense people in their deployments um, in cultural um, issues around Afghanistan before their deployments in the mid 2000s. And, um, I, I've made every possible mistake one can make as a foreigner in Afghanistan. Well, almost every possible mistake. And Afghans were always gracious and kind and um, willing to correct me without um, being offended by the things that I've done wrong. And I, I feel like that's something I bring to uh, as an understanding of this, this culture to share with you. So, um, so that's what we have to offer I, as a linguist. I have to figure out which one. Let's see. Yeah. As a linguist, I really like uh, language. And so I like to focus here and there on it. And I'd say that um, Afghans really do appreciate if you use a few of their expressions. One of the most generic expressions throughout the Islamic world is assalamu alaikum. It's a greeting, hello, peace be upon you. And switch the words around, wa alaikum as salam, it's upon you peace, would be the response. So if someone comes into a room and says, as salam alaikum, it's very easy to say, wa alaikum as salam, and you're already on the right track with Afghan people. Hmm. Afghanistan is a country that sits um, on the crossroads of many major ancient cultures between East and West at the heart of the old Silk Road. Its location is uh, more often defined by where it is not than where it is. Afghanistan is not in the Middle East. It's not in Central Asia. It's not South Asia. It's bits and pieces of some of those things. The population of Afghanistan is about 37 and a half million and the capital city Kabul is about four and a half million. That number is always staggering to me because it was never a city built to house that many people. And it certainly doesn't have the infrastructure to do that. Afghanistan continues to confound its conquer, or its, I should say, not conquerors, because that's not a thing that has happened in Afghanistan, but its invaders, its occupiers, and its so-called guests. It is the home of Rumi the poet, the game of polo, and backgammon. And it's often described as rough and rugged and unconquerable. And it's also breathtakingly beautiful. The cultures of Afghanistan have been influenced over the years by Buddhist monks who traveled through from the East, 
uh, the raiding hordes of Turks from Turkic tribes from the north and the indigenous Indo-European and Indo-Aryan cultures. And of course, Islam, which has profoundly and repeatedly continued to transform Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a landlocked country and it has scant water. All the rivers that run into Afghanistan run out of it as well. So they don't have a lot of control over the water there. The Hindu Kush mountains that you can see here on the map kind of divide the country from Northeast to Southwest. There's a desert in the South and a steppe area in the North. Many of the recent arrivals come from the Southeastern part of the country. The climate is arid. It's rarely below 20 degrees. In the summer, it can be hot and humid in the east while dry in Kabul because of the altitude of nearly 6,000 feet. Afghanistan is more than 70% rural and most people are subsistence farmers. So it takes the work of many family members to make ends meet. And many, uh, many things are described as family enterprise in Afghanistan. Drought has been a persistent problem for years. There is far more arable land than there is water to cultivate. And water rights and land ownership are continuous sources of tension and conflict. There is a saying in Afghanistan that Kabul can be without gold, but not without snow, meaning that the snow bodes well for upcoming agricultural seasons. But nevertheless, the Northeast winter is long and harsh and way more than what most Afghans are accustomed to. I should, I should say I live in New Hampshire, so I, I know this <laughs> personally, happen to be in New York right now, but my home base is New Hampshire. Child labor is common in Afghanistan. In the city, children are often sent out to sell products on the street or run shops. In the countryside, they do agricultural work. In urban areas, children mainly work in the mechanic shops and convenience stores or selling items. In general, children are tasked with many responsibilities at a young age. Even if they are not working, they are looking after younger siblings, preparing food, gathering fuel, shopping alone out in the streets, running errands and things like that, for example. I'm gonna give you a very quick history of modern Afghanistan. Afghanistan was never colonized by the British. Three wars were fought over their attempts to colonize Afghanistan and make it part of the British Empire, but they never the British never succeeded and it is a point of pride among Afghans. Afghanistan's borders were determined during the late 19th century where Russia and British colonial powers vying for territory, influence, wealth and resources uh, fought what was known as the great game. Afghanistan was conquered by neither, but had its borders defined as a buffer zone between those two imperial powers. A political conflict in the 1970s led to the Soviet invasion in 1979, which drove over 3 million Afghan refugees into Pakistan and gave rise to numerous Mujahideen factions bolstered in Pakistan and funded by the US. The US proxy war ended with the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, and the US interest in Afghanistan evaporated along with it. A civil war raged among the Mujahideen factions until 1996, when the Taliban movement rose in response. Their Islamic emirate came out of the Islamic schools of madrasas that educated young Afghan boys in Pakistan. They put an end to civil war, but created a pariah state, plunging the country deeper into poverty and isolation. This all ostensibly ended with the US invasion in October, 2001. So trauma is a big part of all Afghans lives. The country has been in conflict for 45 years and the impacts are present in all aspects of life from loss of relatives and grief to continuous displacement to disrupted social structures and even executive function. Afghanistan is made up of numerous ethnicities, languages, tribes, and different, organize, different ways that people organize themselves. The languages have roots in Indo-European languages, Turkic languages, and Indo-Aryan languages. None of these languages are genetically related to Arabic, which is a Semitic language. And uh, although there's a great deal of Arabic vocabulary in 
Afghan languages, and they share the script in a modified form, but the languages are not related. So the dominant language group, cultural ethno-linguistic group are the Pashtuns that you can see in green on the map. And they are chiefly of the South and East, but also in pockets throughout the North. Uh, they are the largest group. Are, you may have heard of them because of the Taliban, but it's also important to know that the monarchs and the presidents and uh, all kinds of great leaders are, were Pashtuns as well. And uh, what's interesting to me in this map is that you can see the colors um, in the countries over the borders. So you can see where influences, outside influences can be easily um, pushed into Afghanistan. There's a whole big portion of Pakistan that has that same green as well. So the next group in population is the Dari or Tajik speakers. And you see them in kind of blues and purples around the map. And um, they speak a dialect of Persian called Dari in Afghanistan or Tajik or Farsi. Um, and they also are found throughout Afghanistan, and both the Pashtuns and the Tajiks are um, Sunni Muslims. Now, the Hazaras, which is kind of the purple in the middle where it says Bamiyan, uh, make up about 9% of the population, and they, um, they speak Hazaragi or Dari. Uh, Hazaragi is a dialect of Dari, and they've been the most marginalized group. They've been persecuted politically and socially, most practice Shia Islam. And because of that, they have suffered quite a bit under um, Pashtun governments and particularly under the Taliban with massive genocide incidents. Many fled to Iran during the 40 years of conflict and um, quite a few Hazaras migrated to Pakistan, to Quetta in um, the early 20th century and are now Pakistanis. And of course, in the North, I'll just quickly mention there are Uzbeks and Turkmen and uh, Kyrgyz and other Turkic tribes. And in the East, some other related language, uh, other unrelated languages like Nuristani and Pashai. But there's a great rivalry between these groups for many years, competing over land and resources and power. And it certainly contributed to cycles of conflict and dissidence um, in Afghanistan. And because there's so few resources and competition is so fierce, it's everything is a zero sum game. And so there's only one winner and everybody else kind of uh, considered losers in a way. It's also the case that prejudices and rivalries between families or tribes or ethnicities are not left behind in Afghanistan and are brought to the diaspora with them. Just a quick note to clarify that we have an Afghan here and an Afghani. Afghani is the currency of Afghanistan. Some, a lot of people are called Afghans. Some people like to be called Afghanistani. Afghan society is steeped in Islam and it is the central organizing principle in most Afghans lives. The one thing that is common to all Afghans is their commitment to Islam as both a belief system and also a social program. So the idea is that unity of belief is linked to collective well-being and results in social order. Islam brings a strong sense of morality. <clears throat> Sunni Muslims make up about 90% of the population and Shia are about 10%, but both Sunni and Shia follow the religious texts of the Quran and the Hadith, that is the words and actions of the Prophet and the five pillars, prayer, charity, the Ramadan month long fast, the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca, and the declaration of Shahada or the profession of faith. The virgin birth of Jesus is upheld in Islam and Jesus is considered the penultimate prophet mentioned throughout the Quran. Mary or Maryam is revered as well. So Islam pervades all aspects of life. People recite the sayings, they recite quotes from the Quran, they pray or choose not to multiple times a day. And clothing is Islamically informed, modest and loose fitting in general. Islam also informs what is halal, that which is permissible from marriage partners to foods and what is haram, that which is non-permissible such as foods to eat and very particularly pork and alcohol and many other aspects of social interaction and life cycle rituals are dictated by Islam. Mosque attendance is more of a male activity than a female one in Afghanistan, particularly among the Sunnis. So one of the things that Afghans have concern about is that the doctors here do not have their best interests in mind. They feel that because they are Muslims and because they're refugees, they might not get as good treatment. 
And they're particularly concerned about non-permissible ingredients in the medicines that they might be prescribed. So in fact, people are, can be so concerned that they will um, ask relatives to bring them medicines from Pakistan or India or um, Afghanistan. And of course, the medicines there are not well regulated. They might be weaker, they might be stronger, um, but they ask for those medications because those are the ones that they trust and those medications they've had before. Many people self-prescribe pain medications and may become dependent on them, although they might not see that as an addiction. Some are concerned that the hospital food is not halal and they have their relatives bring food to them in the hospital, not always what the doctor has prescribed. The month of Ramadan ends, uh, the month of Ramadan, which just happened, um, is, uh, I think I skipped one of these, sorry, give me a sec. The Islamic calendar is lunar and there's also a solar Afghan calendar. So um, those dates don't line up directly with the dates of our calendar. So this year Ramadan began in early April and ended in early May. It is a month of spiritual reflection and fasting from sun up to sundown. Families often get up before sunrise to have a meal and not take either water or food until the evening meal called iftar. It's celebratory. It's a time for visiting friends and relatives and children often receive new clothes and gifts and they, the appropriate greeting is Ramadan Karim. Since fasting is so important at this time, even pregnant women will fast um, to the detriment of their own health. Now, Islam does not permit people who are physically compromised to fast, but nevertheless, this is a common social practice and women insist on fasting because they would be ashamed if people found out that they were not fasting. People might also refuse to take medical tests at this time, concerned that it might break their fast. Um, the Ramadan ends with the Eid, Eid al-Fit, which is um, a time of celebration as well. And people will say Eid Mubarak, candies and sweets for every holiday. Candies and sweets are appropriate and what people expect to, to have and give. Of course, there are many other holidays in the Islamic calendar, but since none of them are right around now, I thought um, I wouldn't add them in for now. Birthdays are not, not customarily celebrated. Till recently, many people did not even record their births. And so many Afghans, when they came here and had to have proper documents, they would choose a birthday, many of them choosing January 1st as the first day of the year as a birthday. A lot of people um, also choose March 21st, which is um, Persian New Year's Day, known as No Ruse, as a, as a birth, an official birthday. Other core concepts that are organizing principles in Afghan society include honor, family, and gender roles. So Afghan communities, especially the villages and the rural regions, tend to be self-governing. There has never been much reach of the government into the rural regions, and the government is seen as corrupt, rapacious, unreliable, and unavailable. Suspicion runs high of government representation and authorities. Therefore, Afghans prefer to avoid authorities and manage their affairs themselves. This often extends to medical personnel and Western medicine structures and practices. Developing trust and positive relationships to government representatives and all kinds of figures of authority will take time. And there are numerous structural differences between the way medicine is practiced in Afghanistan and here. So, for instance, there's almost no preventative care in Afghanistan. Medicine tends to be problem oriented. If you are in pain or distress, you go to a doctor or clinic and you're seen without an appointment and usually given medicine at the very least some vitamins and records aren't kept. So that's definitely different from the way we do it here. Much social behavior is influenced by Afghans' awareness of their personal honor. So honor refers to someone's reputation, their prestige, their community standing. And a person's reputation precedes them in all things. So I like to think of it as a wheelbarrow. Generations of families are kind of riding up front of the wheelbarrow with all of their honor and their wealth and their piety and their humility. And the individual, 
themselves pushing the wheelbarrow from behind is responsible for protecting all of the all that goes before them. And so when they go out into the world, they're not going out as an individual so much as a, an entire package. And, um, and so they're, and they're doing so for their current, previous and future family members. So a person's, most people in Afghanistan consider a person's behavior to be reflective of the family. If a behavior is perceived as dishonorable, the family shares the shame. And if this occurs in the wider sphere, then the shame um, is felt by the ethnic group, the tribe, or even the religion. So preservation and of honor and community opinion is often foremost in people's minds, and this cannot be overstated. It influences people to behave conservatively in accordance with social expectations to avoid drawing attention to themselves or doing or risk doing something that's perceived as dishonorable. It puts a great deal of pressure on people, especially youth growing up here to maintain strict social boundaries. This may lead to prejudice against those who risk stepping out and causes emotional distress and even sometimes physical harm. So the senior male member of the family is responsible to protect the honor and well-being of the family, particularly where that concerns the behavior of women around dress and social interactions, education, work, and public presence. It can be seen as a loss of honor to the father, the brother, the husband, if a woman does not comply with their expectations. This can be a source of mental distress for both parties. So family, familial, tribal, ethnic rivalries also persist uh, among these new arrivals. With respect to the family, the core notion of public versus private is at play. Private is both physical and social. Family matters are part of that which is private. An Afghan home is a fortress surrounded by high mud brick walls. And as you can see in these images, there are no windows to the outside. The social space faces inner, the inner courtyard. Three or four generations could be sharing in this space. A nuclear family may have only one or two rooms to themselves and the families tend to sleep together in one room. There's precious little sense of privacy or private space in Afghan households. And by the same token, social isolation is considered severe punishment and the notion of time out might be considered cruel. With respect to privacy, women often refuse to be seen by male medical practitioners. A female medical practitioner isn't always available to them and they may refuse certain tests or x-rays because of their concerns for their privacy and modesty. In fact, in rural Afghanistan, where there are few to none female doctors, the men in the household will go to the doctor on behalf of the female describe her complaints and return with medication. And if they're really sick, the man will go back and forth multiple times. And I've seen that personally. In urban areas, space is even more limited and people live in small compounds or in apartment blocks. And there's, this is uh, somewhere in Kabul city, but there are many apartment blocks as well. Um, people in urban settings have more access to medical options but there's still, it's still problem oriented approach and no prevention and as part of the approach. So mental health issues, though widespread, are barely addressed. Afghans can be quite emotional or as they describe it, hot, um, quick to anger, lash out, quite demonstrative, physically uh, rough and, and abusive. Women sometimes threaten to kill themselves even though they have no intention. It's an, almost like an expression you know, if they don't want something or they'll threaten that, of course, um, these types of threats and behaviors can't go unreported here. And that raises many privacy issues for Afghans and reinforces the trust issues around authorities, of course. Women's sphere is inside the home and women are in charge of all the domestic chores, um, cooking, cleaning, raising children, preparing food for guests. And in large families, childcare is passed down the line to the older children. Children do, um, ch girls, I should say, do all the housework. So you need your daughters to do the housework. In, ge in general, gender roles are quite clearly defined and uh, daughters do most of the work. And that's true, not just in Afghanistan, but also in the diaspora. 
I, I focus on laundry, which seems a little mundane for a moment here, but laundry in general in Afghanistan is done by hand and women prefer to do it themselves at home. It's a point of privacy and of pride to do the family's laundry and the laundry of their guests. So if someone's come to your house overnight, they might have one change of clothes and the women will do the laundry. Um, in such a dry climate, it dries very quickly. Uh, laundromats are not welcome here. People are not comfortable going to them. And if you wanna give a small gift, a portable washer that hooks up to a sink can really be that thing that really helps people, particularly women. Afghans don't typically change their clothes uh, often, and they don't generally change into pajamas to go to sleep. I'm, I'm not talking about Afghans who've lived here a long time. I'm talking about newly arrived or people from the countryside. Personal hygiene comes at a high cost in Afghanistan where water is scarce and heating water is uh, requires precious fuel. And um, people just uh, don't see personal hygiene or the hygiene of their children as all that important. And deodorant is not something people use or have a tradition using. As you can see, conditions differ greatly in urban settings and the evacuees coming here are both from urban and rural backgrounds. Is this actually your house? I know Zala's in this picture. Is it your house, Zala? Uh, no, no, that's my friend's house. Uh, oh, she okay. is also, she was evacuated and she lives in Alexandria now, but yeah, that's her house. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I'm in the picture, the blue dress. <laughs> right, and actually the last house with the laundry, that was my house in Afghanistan. <laughs> so we really have lived here. <laughs> So even in the city, much of the housework falls on girls and there's less manual uh, labor for girls and they have more education, more opportunity to be educated in urban settings. Babies are typically swaddled in this way for most of their first year and uh, surma or coal is uh, black powder is rubbed into their eyes. It might be part of a superstitious practice. People say it makes them look attractive. They think it's, they say it's good for them. Um, and um, lar large families are highly valued, uh, particularly those with lots of sons. And a lot of families are, you know, the, I think the average is somewhere between six and 10. So they're large families, uh, six and 10 children. Many women give birth alone in the countryside, rarely in hospitals. Maternal and infant mortality can be quite high in some areas. Someone told me that in addition to the swaddling, which they, they swaddle very tight. I know tight swaddling is important for babies, but um, some doctors are concerned with how tight the babies are swaddled here and for how long that they're swaddled for. And um, that's a point of contention and distrust with the doctors. They also um, put lemon in their underarms. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's some kind of superstitious behavior I was told and they give them uh, gripe water to newborns or uh, water made with fennel to newborns. In fact, in some communities that I've seen this myself, they don't actually uh, nurse the babies, the colostrum. They think that that's bad for the babies. And so they don't even give them that when they're, when they're brand newborn. Uh, the men's role is chiefly outside the home. So in the public sphere, and they're responsible in general for the economic well-being of the family. Um, and it could take a lot of men working in a household to, to provide for a family. Women sometimes in the countryside earn some income through home-based businesses, um, food preparation, cheese making, embroidery, tailoring. In the urban areas, women have more opportunities to work, at, or did, I should say, until the Taliban came back, and particularly for educated women. But there's many households uh, where women are the sole earners, and particularly with Zala's um, social enterprise now, she hires women who are the, um, the sole earners for their families. And if it weren't for these women going to work, these families would be in terrible conditions. So family structure, of course, is very traditional and patriarchal, and most of the decisions are taken by the father or the husband. And um, of course, much of this is in flux. The urban educated, uh, not so not so strictly as the um, as the rural people in, in terms of these uh, structures. But many of the rural people I know who've emigrated to the U.S. or Europe um, do follow these patterns. They want their women not to be working. They want them to be staying home and taking care of the children. And um, it can take many years of resettlement for them to learn the local language to 
uh, have an opportunity to work or and, and to learn how to drive, which could take a long time as well. So of course, women really suffer from the pressures of managing a large household, from the lack of mobility and for the choices, the lack of choices, I should say, in their lives. Um, in the diaspora, some women become more isolated by fathers and husbands who are particularly conservative and restrict their mobility even further. Others will have some access to improved conditions here with mobility and going to classes, but may find themselves thwarted in um, economic difficulties by the, by, by the economic difficulties and the lack of family support. So without family support, nothing is possible or everything is difficult. Pastimes are mostly very social. So visiting friends and family is uh, really important in Afghanistan and gossiping and telling stories also is the way uh, information moves very fast. Dry fruit and nuts are served with tea, green tea with cardamom at, all the time. And it's the most minimal gesture. This is obviously not a minimal gesture of hospitality, a very lovely one, but at the least you would be served a cup of green tea with cardamom and um, some candy or something like that. And accepting or offering tea is proper etiquette. So you, you, you should never refuse a, a cup of tea that's offered to you and see it as a gesture of etiquette friendship. Uh, pets, usually birds in Afghanistan, um, but not the kind of house pets that we keep. Dogs are considered particularly dirty, not kept in the house. They're guard dogs or fighting dogs in Afghanistan. And um, uh, people um, can be quite afraid of dogs. They're not used to family dogs. So if, um, if you invite an Afghan family to your house, just put the dogs away so that nobody has to be worried about them or afraid of them. Children show deference and respect to their elders. Even when grown up, they expect their elders to know what's best for them and to make important life decisions for them. This extends to marriage um, as well. And most marriages, not all of course, are arranged by parents. Arranging marriages, celebrations uh, of engagement, entertaining guests are hugely important to Afghans. In some cases, parents engage their babies to each other to solidify bonds. In other cases, individuals find their own mates in love marriages. And this is particularly true among the urban um, educated. But marriages can be quite fraught and there are numerous circumstances under which a girl is married to someone she does not wish to be married to. She may be decades younger than her husband or a second or third wife. She may have been married off to settle a family debt or a dispute. She may be in an abusive relationship. Domestic violence is widespread in Afghanistan and where divorce is taboo, uh, women sometimes attempt to escape and might find their way to a shelter in Afghanistan, also very complicated. Um, here, women quickly learn their rights and their options, which often causes more friction in a household. Additionally, gender dysphoria, LGBTQIA, totally taboo concepts. Anyone with these issues, which may find more social space and acceptance in the US, um, will find severe social sanctions within the Afghan community. And much of it could be blamed on influence of non-Islamic Western ideologies. So I know I just threw a lot out there. There's considerable range of attitudes among Afghans toward education. In rural areas, there's widespread reserve about education, especially of girls, and education is limited and low by comparison to the US and other places. Lack of literacy is commonplace and it's not shameful. And students with learning issues may simply stop attending school in Afghanistan. School is not mandatory, but here, of course, they don't have that option. And so the challenges for children are often swept under the rug. Uh, the general idea being that, that if a child is having learning problems, then maybe their lives won't amount to much of anything. They don't expect them to get better. And so they just let them be. And this notion of treatment for better outcomes just doesn't exist. Uh, schools in Afghanistan are for the most part gender segregated so that you know here they're not and that is can be challenging for some and pa parents are not involved in their children's education. Um, 
teachers are held in high regard, but in Afghanistan, um, corporal punishment is still used in schools and, um, at, and at home. In large families, parents do not always attend to their children's needs, educational, physical, health-wise, all of that. They allow them to play unsupervised outside. They allow them to wander as they would in Afghanistan. There's no notion of bedtime. That kids are often um, allowed to play with iPads or phones for hours and way into late into the night, none of which bodes well for getting up early to go to school in the morning. Some changes have happened over the past 20 years in Afghanistan with US and coalition involvement, but those changes apply much less to the rural areas and that's where a majority of the evacuees are coming from, particularly in, in Springfield area. So during the previous Taliban regime, women's um, mobility was restricted, their ability to work was restricted, education was restricted, um, and uh, dress codes were very strict. And um, much of that changed in the last 20 years, and now it's, it's going back in that direction. But the families tend to be quite conservative in general, and uh, women and girls have been limited, even in the most, um, most progressive of families. Um, in general, there's an idea in Afghanistan that women should not be seen outside the family and that women are typically accompanied by a mahram, so a male escort. It could even be a, a, ch a male child. And you'll see that women are not out alone hardly ever. And even when they're seeking medical attention or treatment, they, they don't come alone for the most part. Even though women have fought hard to gain legitimacy and authority in public, decision-making in parts of Afghanistan, they're still um, consider that they're that themselves to be obedient to their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. And often women and girls will not speak in front of um, men. They will not speak before men and sometimes not speak at all in male presence. And of course, this is a, these are all causes for mental distress. And in Afghanistan, there's no um, medical solution for any of these issues. So socialization in Afghanistan tends to be gender segregated. So men socialize with men, girl, uh, women socialize with women, um, of course, not across the board and uh, urban educated circles, they're especially formal gatherings. There may be men and women together, but generally they're separate. Men hold men's hands. It's a gesture of friendship and women are affectionate with women. So cross gender contact is uh, something to avoid and I'm not concerned about people shaking hands anymore during COVID, but just to be aware that cross-gender contact, being alone in a room, cross-gender with a door closed is a big no-no. So door should always be open. So nobody ever wonders, actually men, men, women, women, what's going on. Nobody should ever have to wonder what, what might be going on in those circumstances. So to address communication in general, which I think is one of the biggest differences between um, the way we see things in the US and in Afghanistan is um, through communication strategies. Uh, I heard this expression somewhere recently where it was uh, some things need to be said and some things need to be understood. And I think that that's a good way of characterizing the difference between our communication styles. We Americans like to have things said. We like them explicit. We, we don't rely on implication. Our style is direct and we don't uh, read verbal, nonverbal cues. By contrast, in Afghanistan, it's a, highly con it's a high context society. Meaning is embedded in sociocultural context and much communication is implicit. And the focus is, is, what it is on what's understood. People tell analogies, they'll share analogies, tell stories um, as a way of, um, to communicate through implication. Um, and this connects with notions of honor, because if you are indirect, then you are not going to step on someone's dignity or honor. You're, you're preserving it at all costs. And um, you may, um, Afghans may find it hard to ask for assistance, especially in front of other people, because it shows weakness. In the same way, asking someone if they understand or if they know what you're talking about, that might embarrass them. So it's hard to always verify uh, if the instructions have been um, understood. I've been told that Afghans don't follow medical or health advice. They don't finish medication often or make follow-up visits. So this is the kind of thing where it has to be pursued a little bit stronger than in other cases. 
but I have to say Afghans are incredibly gracious and it's not their custom to say thank you for every little thing. Um, that if they do, they've picked that up from us, but they have other gestures of uh, appreciation for sure. And this takes us to time orientation, which I think is a really important uh, um, difference between Afghans and Americans. So somebody said to me once, Americans have watches and Afghans have time. And isn't that the truth? So partly has to do with different structures in our societies. Ours is so commodified, monetized, punctuality matters, time is money. It's not a shared notion in Afghanistan. And time is much more flexibly viewed. So making appointments coming early or on time is not important. Many think that if they come around around the time that they were supposed to be seen, that they would be seen even though they have missed their appointment and have to reschedule, and that's problematic. They don't keep track of their records, immunizations, medical records. They don't have a system for organizing. And I'd say that's part of how trauma affects executive function. Um, and uh, yeah, insurance cards are misplaced. All that sort of stuff is, is hard for them to keep track of. It's just not their way of doing things. Nearing the end of our talk, I wanted to say a few words about food as well. This, um, Afghans are used to eating fresh food. Most village homes have no refrigeration. Even in Kabul city, the electricity isn't all that reliable. So food is prepared daily and not often not much left overnight. Family style eating means generally sitting on the floor and uh, around this tablecloth. Although of course people sit at tables as you saw in that other picture with Zala recently. And hospitality is very important to Afghans. They're very gracious hosts, but nutrition is not a thing and attention is not given to it. So lots of sweets are eaten by people. Um, cooking is done in large quantities, so not specialized meals for people with uh, needing a low sodium diet, that's complicated and hard to do. In fact, Afghan food tends to be salty and oily, and that's one of the ways that you show you know, your, your, your um, hospitality. And um, so, so especially in large families, not much attention is being paid to what children are eating and that could, or anybody's eating, and that could be a problem. For, um, preventative medical care, dental care, eye care, exercise, heart healthy eating, mindfulness, attention to mental health and stress. These are all new ideas and they'll take time to get across. Uh, while many circumstances and conditions contribute to mental health outcomes, the lack of awareness of treatment is one of the biggest barriers. Since medicine is often sought on an emergency basis, the expectation is that treatment also will be dispensed immediately and quickly. Our system of primary care, testing specialists is unfamiliar and it just doesn't make sense to them. They often conclude that doctors here are not very good and don't know what they don't know anything because they have to keep doing all these tests and so by doing all these tests it must mean that um that they don't really know what they're doing and that's kind of what people think that the doctors are not that knowledgeable so yet again trust is a big problem i'm actually going to stop here so we have a few minutes left for questions and um and then we'll uh we'll see which direction and what some of the needs are of the people who are attending so i'll stop sharing Thank you, Rachel. That was awesome. Um, we can open it now for questions. We have about 10 minutes. Um, anyone who has a question about mental health or the presentation or something that came up on your work, um, feel free to either write it on the chat or just say it out loud. Yeah, or raise your hand, say it out loud. Yeah. And yeah. That would be great. And we'll see what we can do to answer. And if you have things you want us to think about to get back to you on for next week, if we don't know immediately, then please put it out there for us. Anything you guys want to add to the mental health aspect? Zella, I know you have a lot of work with the community and Rachel too. I think we have a question yeah. also on the chat, but uh, one thing that I wanted to, uh, as a follow-up to what Rachel 
was talking about the trust here. It's mm -hmm. also has to do with like, of course, they are not very used to a lot of tests, you know, to be done <laughs> before they get the medicine. So it's a thing in Afghanistan. If the doctor give you a lot of medicine, so it means he or she is a good doctor. doctor. <laughs> but it's more like that way of like that perspective that they love medicine. Like I used, like my grandma, mother, she, she died a few years ago, but she loved, for example, if she would go to the doctor and the doctor wouldn't give her a lot of medicine she wouldn't be happy from the doctor same with my mom even you know like my mom is still in Afghanistan she loves you know medicine and I think that's one idea especially for the kids you don't get that here you don't sometimes even I'm like so mad because my son has fever and I take him he's only four and then like that you know that mindset uh, of course I don't think that to that extent but I'm just saying that's a that might be an issue and they might get mad even, you know, like, oh, I mean, you know, I'm sick and the doctor is not giving me medicine. So um, probably then they relate that to as the doctor doesn't know, the doctor doesn't pay attention to me and my needs, um, all of that. But in general, as we also said, another comment that I wanted to make that in Afghanistan, two groups that people really uh, respect and can easily trust outside the family is the teachers and the doctors. So <laughs> this is a good, like, you know, these two groups that you can easily like build that trust uh, compared to other groups in the community. They really trust soon. And once, you know, yeah, uh, they have this respect, you know, for them. I would also, I mean, I have also seen people say to me, this is not a good doctor because they didn't give me medicine. <laughs> it's so common, but also, I mean, a good doctor, even in Afghanistan, at the least they'll they'll prescribe and they just dispense it. You don't have, nothing's controlled. Right. But they will prescribe um, vitamins at the very least because everybody needs vitamins there. And so people are at least satisfied if they get some vitamins. Um, any other comments, questions? We have five minutes. We can go home early for five minutes. <laughs> it's okay. If we gather next week, or if anyone has a question now, we'll take it. Yeah, the, okay. And there's also another, I think, something on the chat. Let me ask him a question. Okay. Can you guys read it? Yes, yes, it's a tough you one. You got it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's of child abuse. You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a really tough one. And um, people are reluctant. I know from the Afghan perspective, people are reluctant to take their children to the emergency sometimes if they're injured, because if they've been once or twice to the emergency room, then there may be a report about their child, even if that's an accident prone child. And I had friends in the UK who had their children taken away from them for a year because one, you know, somebody got hurt. And um, of course, the entire Afghan community there knew about this. So not only was it shameful for them, but it was um, it was terrifying. And I know one woman with back to the swaddling, she um, the social worker had told her this is in England not to swaddle the baby, but she didn't know how else to swaddle the baby except with that uh, kind of sash and so she didn't know how to comfort the baby and when I came to visit even though I came as a linguist to, to ask questions of her husband she was sure I was a social worker and terrified that I was going to uh, inspect how she was taking care of her baby so you know the trust issue is really a big one yeah yeah I just wanted to add that I witnessed this child uh, a child who was like um when I was at the base for two months so we had this case where the girl was like 11 I think or 12 and she was being beaten by her uh, mom in this case uh she was the eldest even for simple things as not uh, that if she wouldn't wash the dishes or like something then she would be beaten from like uh, a very young age in Kandahar so they were not illiterate and they came from Kandahar so probably she said some somebody and then they brought her to the clinic so we had all like a few sessions while I was there 
the, the, but still she was like, she would tell you, but at the same time, she had so much respect for her mom. And so that's the thing, it's culture and socially speaking, child abuse or things like that is not a thing in Afghanistan. Parents are like, they, they think it's their right, you know, to abuse their, like hitting your child is not an abuse. <laughs> Uh, so in Afghanistan, it doesn't consider. So that's why the, having like orientation sessions, both for the kids and the parents, it's very important. Otherwise, there would be a lot of issues and uh, challenges and confusion as what is it, you know, because if a parent thinks it's my right to hit my child, so in school or nobody can say anything, because that's how it is in Afghanistan. Nobody will arrest you because you hit your child, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Even if the child go and complain to the police, they say, it's okay, it's your parents. They know they do it for your good. Right. So uh, that's why it's very important, like uh, getting to more like complicated cases. It's, it's orientation and like introducing the law, the regulations, and like, what's the consequence, you know, doing that, you know, they can take your child away from you. Let's say if you hit your child and then the child goes to the school and then the teacher notice that. Uh, so those are like, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, and I would I would second that and especially in person one on one Afghanistan and Afghans, it's a very oral culture, it's a very oral society sending pamphlets home explaining things is not going to get through but people hearing it face to face having a little conversation about it. That may be beyond your your um, agency's means to do that sort of thing, but that is one of the ways to really help people understand it's going to take multiple orientations around. Like the question here about how do we, um, you know, how do we help them understand how medicine works here, is explaining it, you know, and maybe explaining it in a group, um, so that people hear it over and over. That's that's one of my same thing with maybe some of the mental health issues. Really, maybe even bringing people together to talk about not their own issues, of course, but somebody else, you know, sort of in general, so that they get the idea of what is okay and isn't okay. So having some kind of um, discussion, group discussions. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, we'll have a lot more time next week for all the questions. I think it's a good time to soak in all the information. I'll post that video. If you need the video or you want to share it with your team, please shoot me an email um, and I can send you the recording afterwards. Um, but we can regroup next week and talk about any questions or again, situations that you go through. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Zala. And thank you all who attended. I will send you the calendar invite when we're closer to, closer to the date. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.